Hey, good morning, Go Church family, and a very Merry Christmas to you. Come on now. I want to take just a moment here and just share uh, from my heart and from the heart of, of the Worley family just how grateful we are for all of you. It is the highest honor for us to be considered your pastor, your spiritual leader. And so I just want to tell you in this Christmas season how much we appreciate you how much we are blessed by you, and how much we love you. No matter what campus you're a part of, maybe you're in this room, our South Metro Atlanta campus, you're on the west side of Atlanta, or in Montgomery County, Maryland, whoever you are, even if you're watching online today, I just want you to know here at Go Church, we love you, love you, love you, love you. As a matter of fact, we love you to life. Come on, somebody. So can everybody put your hands together, greet your big family, your Go Church family, every campus. Come on, a little bit better. Come on now. Love you, love you, love you. You know what else we love? We love our military, our uh, first responders. We love those who are veterans of the military, active duty, and all of those that are on the front line. We just love you so much. We thank God for you. And so whatever campus you're at today, if you are in the military, even a veteran of the military, or currently a first responder, we want to show you some love. Will you put your hand up real quick? And I want every campus to go crazy for these men and women. Come on, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, come on, let's go. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Five more seconds. God bless you. Love you, appreciate you. Come on. God bless you real loud. Here we go. It's good. All right, lots of stuff happening at Go Church. A lot of great things. We're in the middle of our legacy offering. It's the only special offering that we do every year. Uh, this is an offering that goes above and beyond your normal giving. And if you're new to Go Church, I'll tell you real quick why we do that. It's because of this offering, 100% of what is collected, we give away to our legacy partners. And so I just want to tell you, you can give to the legacy offering all the way until 1159 on December 31. And on Vision Sunday, the first Sunday in February, I'll tell you the grand total of this legacy offering. But I do want to tell you that we've got a real good chance of surpassing last year's legacy total. Come on. So jump in, 100% participation. We've got Christmas Eve uh, gatherings happening uh, this Christmas Eve. You heard about this uh, at all of our campuses. Tickets went fast, but we will make room for you. So if you're in town, bring your family and your friends. Come to Go Church on Christmas Eve. Then we get into the new year. Can you believe it? 2023. January 1 on Sunday, uh, we're coming together. We're kicking off a new series. I want you to be in the house on New Year's Day, Sunday. Not a better way to start the new year than in the presence of Jesus. Give me a good amen right there. We're also kicking off Deeper 21 on that day, 21 days of prayer and fasting. All of the information is online and on the app. We're coming together Monday through Friday at 7 a.m. for one hour of, of worship, devotion, and prayer. And then on Saturdays at 9, whatever your schedule allows, whether you can pray with us in person or you have to pray and fast on your own time and schedule, I want everybody to jump in. The most important thing we do as a church family is 21 days of prayer and fasting. And uh, we're believing that it's going to be a year of miracles. Anybody need a miracle? Come on, we're believing 2023 to be just that, all right? All right, let me give you a little bit of an understanding of where we are. We're doing a series right now called A Thrill of Hope. This is a three-part series, all right? We did part one last Sunday. We're doing part two today. And then I'll close out the conversation on Christmas Eve. Now, on Christmas Day, Sunday, Christmas Day, there's a special online gathering for you and your family, and I've got a message there that I'm titling Christmas in Three Words. So on Christmas Day, jump online, but we'll finish A Thrill of Hope a next, next uh, gathering, which is Christmas Eve. We'll talk today about it, and then on Christmas Eve. So we're talking a lot about who Jesus is and the hope that he brings. So whatever campus you're at, even if you're watching online, get some notes, something to take notes with. There's a blank note card and a seat near you. I want you to write down some thoughts today. Let me offer a prayer. Let's jump right into the message and believe that this thrill of hope we get to know and discover personally and powerfully. All right, every head bowed, every eye closed. I always like to take 10 seconds as a moment of reflection and meditation, concentration, block out all the busyness of the season and all the things you got going. After 10 seconds, I'll pray for you and we'll jump into the message together, okay? Here we go. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I feel your presence, Jesus. You are good to us, Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And we give you the glory and we give you the honor. And we invite you, Jesus, into this conversation. Do a powerful work in us and through us. And we give you thanks in advance of that work that you're doing. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said amen and amen. We've applauded a lot of people. None greater than King Jesus. Come on, let's do that well and let's do it now. Come on, church. Woo. Oh, come on, somebody clap like God's been good to you. Come on now. All right, last, last Sunday we kicked off this conversation and we talked on the idea of a thrill of hope. And I, I titled that particular message that hope has a name, and his name is Jesus. Come on now. If I'm titling today's conversation under the umbrella of the series A Thrill of Hope, I would title it this, Hope Changes Everything. Well, somebody else, even a little greater enthusiasm, give me an amen right there. Come on, like, hope changes everything. As a matter of fact, you might know the person you're sitting next to, or, or maybe they're, they're, they're a, a new friend to you. But I want you to look at them and say, hope changes everything. Come on, tell them that. Look them in the eye, tell them, say, hope changes everything. Now I want you to look at somebody else and say, I may know you, I may not know you, but whatever it is you're going through, I want you to be encouraged that hope changes everything. Go ahead. Come on, somebody give an encouraging word to an individual today that hope really does change not some things, not a few things, not might change some things, but hope, real hope in God changes everything. And I believe that many of you, you walked into a Go Church campus today and you need a little extra hope in your hope tank. You're going through some stuff, challenged in storms of life and difficulties. We sing about this during Christmas that it's the most wonderful time of the year, but really the holidays create a uh, greater anxiety, depression. It magnifies grief and suffering and loss. And I think that today this message can encourage you that hope in Jesus changes everything. I shared this with you last Sunday. This is genuinely, genuinely, this has been my prayer for you leading up to this conversation. This is Paul's prayer uh, recorded in Romans. He's praying this over the church at Rome. And today I'm, I'm praying this and prophesying this over the, the Go Church family. I want, I want you to see this. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. How many of you need hope, joy, peace? Come on, let me see your hand today. That's me. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. And here's a part of the prayer that you've got to understand. As you trust in him, you've got to trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I was praying this prayer again this week leading up to the conversation today and and I believe that the Holy Spirit showed me two truths about Romans 15, 13, all right? And you can write these down if you're taking notes. They're not going to be on the TV. But I want you to know that in Romans 15, 13, we are introduced to the God of hope. And he is the source of all hope. And he is the supplier of all hope. Can I get an amen? That God, just, God doesn't just inspire hope, but he is the author of hope. He is the source of all hope. And he supplies it, right? And whenever you need hope and you go to God desiring hope, there is always hope in stock. In God's inventory, he never runs out of hope. Can I get an amen? Does that make sense? Let me put it to you like this. Some of y'all tried to buy somebody a gift and they were out of stock, right? So you tried to buy something and you realize, man, I, I missed the deal. Now they're out of stock. When it comes to hope in God, he is never out of stock. As a matter of fact, his hope, he's got so much hope, he is the supplier of hope, that his hope overflows. That there is this never-ending well of hope. And this is my prayer for you. I'll, I'll give you this uh, same verse, but not in a plural approach, more in a singular approach. Because I want you to pray this over your heart, over your home, over your family, over this season of life. You ready? On the count of three, every campus, pray this aloud and hold on to it with great ownership. This is a promise of God. You ready? One, two, three. May the God of hope fill me with all joy and peace as I trust in him so that I may overflow with hope 
by the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you receive that today? Come on, hold on to that. And we need it in this world. And this world is messy. This world is messed up. People have lost their minds. I mean, there's a lot of suffering and a lot of grief and a lot of pain. And watch this, listen to me. And the more that as a society and as a culture, the more we drift from God, the more we stray away from God, the more we forget God, the more hopelessness will abound. Your Bible talks about this in Job chapter 8, verse 13. This is the Living Bible translation. Watch this. Those who forget God have no hope. And I think that's what's happening in so many hearts and homes across America is that we are forgetting God. We're straying from God. We're drifting from God. And it's no wonder why we lack hope because we've run away from the source and the supplier of all hope. Does that make sense? Can I just preach to you today? Is that all right? I want to encourage you with the passion in my heart that we cannot drift from God. We can't stray from God and forget God and wonder why we lack hope. When you look at the Bible, and you could talk about your own experiences of drifting from God and straying from God and forgetting God and where you end up. And when you look at the Bible, the Bible is full of personalities that they once knew God and loved God, but at some point, They had forgotten God, and look at the outcome. I think about Lot. When Lot pitched his tent right outside of Sodom, it wasn't very long before the original sin city tempted his family, and they strayed from God. I think about Samson. Samson, who was full of strength and anointing, but when he began to forget God, he he fell into temptation with Delilah, and there he laid his head in her lap, and it was the pagan culture that ended up taking him out. Even David, a man after God's own heart, when he began to forget God, he sinned with Bathsheba, committing adultery, and you can read his prayer of repentance in Psalm 51. So what happens when a culture forgets God. What happens when individuals forget God? Watch this. They have no hope. We stray, we drift, we forget, and hopelessness abounds. You'll have to take a picture of this. They'll make it large on the screen, but I'll tell you exactly what happens when a culture forgets God. Wealth is idolized. Truth is minimized. Life is trivialized. Abortion is legalized. Television is vulgarized. Entertainment is sexualized. Our consciences become desensitized. Education is secularized. Races are polarized. Morals and ethics are liberalized. Sex is commercialized. Crime is sensationalized. Immorality is popularized. Drugs are legitimized. Sin is glamorized. The courts are paralyzed. The breakup of the family is rationalized. Manners are uncivilized. Christians are demonized. And God is marginalized. Now, I need a hundred people that will put your hands together with affirmation that we will not forget God, that we will not stray from God, that we won't drift away from God. We, if we've ever needed God before, we need Him now. We're on a fast track to no hope city, but there is hope, and hope has a name, and His name is Jesus, and watch this, and His hope Woo! Changes everything. His hope changes everything. Lord, forgive us for forgetting you. Forgive us for drifting from you and straying from you. We invite you, Lord, back into our hearts and our family and our society. Hope has a name and hope changes everything. Write these thoughts down. There are actually three different types of hope. I'll talk about all three, and we'll move through the first two fairly quickly. But there are three types of hope. The first type of hope is called wishful hope. And this is actually the most common type of hope. And and all of us, we all have different wishes, you know. So even on your birthday, when they blow out the candles, all right, make a wish. And you're hoping for whatever it is that you're wishing to come true. And and for some of you, there's a lot of candles on that cake. Come on, somebody. And... (laughs) 
<laughs> you got a lot of hope going on right there, you know. You can't even blow it out anymore. You got to get a fire extinguisher. Come on. Some. But it's wishful hope. It's, man, I, I, I hope that my favorite team wins. I hope I get a parking spot at the Walmart. Come on, somebody. I hope we get a, a table at the restaurant. I, I hope I get that Christmas gift that I put on my, my, my Christmas list. It's wishful hope. And wishful hope is, is optimism. It's based out of optimism. Now, I would r much rather you be optimistic than pessimistic. Come on. Like, anybody know somebody that's just pessimistic like, like the sky is always falling and the world is always coming to an end? And you can be like, hey, it's a beautiful day. And they're like, is it? Could it not be any brighter? You know, and it's like, man, the birds are singing, the sun is shining, but they all, how many of you know who I'm talking about? Like in your mind, you can think of that prayer like they're all. So I would much rather you be optimistic than pessimistic. But watch this, when we talk about biblical hope in Jesus, it's far greater than just optimism. Optimism is psychological, but the hope that I'm preaching about is theological. Does that make sense? It's far greater than just wishing something and to happen it's an expectation a belief that because God promised it it's going to happen then there is an expectant hope and this one there there is some basis to reality when it comes to expectant hope uh, for example when whenever you see a woman that is pregnant with child a phrase that we use is she's expecting and I don't know who needs to hear this today but I just want to just encourage you with before you say congratulations to her for being pregnant, can you just, like, make sure she actually is pregnant? Come on, somebody. Like, like oh, congratulations. When are you due? Due for what? You know. <laughs> just before you, but when a woman is with child, we say that she's expecting. She's expecting uh, to give birth to a healthy baby boy or a healthy baby girl. There's an expectation there that this life within the mother's womb is going to be born and born with great health and born with great purpose. So there's this expectant hope. But in a church this size, I can guarantee you that there are dozens of stories of, of families and mothers that they expected the pregnancy to go a particular direction. But even the expectant hope ended up in disappointment. As people dealt with miscarriages or maybe you're expecting to be pregnant, but that hasn't happened yet. See, wishful hope and expectant hope there are some reality connected to it, but they're still based on, like, the natural. But then there is a third type of hope, and this is the hope that I really want to talk to you about. It's not wishful hope. It's not expectant hope, but it is certain hope. And this is the greatest of all kinds of hope because it is a guaranteed hope. It is an assured hope. It is a promise of God and from God and if God said it, then it's going to happen. Does that make sense? It's a certain hope. Certain hope is what helps you get through the storms of life. Certain hope is what keeps your soul alive. Certain hope is what will allow you to get out of bed every morning when you don't want to get out of bed every morning. It's, it's certain hope. And the Bible says, don't anchor your soul to wishful hope. Don't anchor your soul to expectant hope. But there is a certain hope, and it can be an anchor for your soul. Does that make sense? Hebrews 6, 19, that's what it says right here, that we have this, somebody shout, certain hope. Certain hope as an anchor for the soul, both firm and secure. I, I don't always talk much about boating and being on the water because that's not a sport or an activity that I'm very knowledged in or good in. And I also tend to get a little seasick. Come on, somebody. How many of you are with me on that? Like, we went on a cruise over the Thanksgiving break, and Kimberly brought every type of seasickness medication that you could think. I think she was just trying to drug me up. Come on, somebody. She was trying to drug me up and take advantage of me, y'all. Y'all need to pray for your pastor. But anyway, I digress. Um, you don't need drugs, baby. Come on now. It's the turtleneck, y'all. Come on, somebody. But I get out on the water, and that, and that boat, woo starts moving. And I actually did pretty well on the cruise until we sat down at dinner, you know, and then, and then you look at the table and your water cup is like that and you think, oh dear Lord, we're halfway sideways, upside down ways, come on. But I do know that no matter how, how treacherous the waters can become, no matter how beat down we may feel when the waves 
of life and the storms of life come, if you will just drop an anchor, if you'll drop an anchor, that's, listen, somebody hear this word, come on, that storm is going to pass, come on, it will pass, and you can have an anchor for your soul, a certain hope, it is firm, and it is secure, and watch this, a certain hope, a promise from God, it's not about what you want, it's about God's will. It's not about what you see, it's about what God says. It is a certain hope, and write this thought down, certain hope is not a probability. It is a promise, and it is a promise from God, firm and secure. And if I could encourage you any, with anything in your, in your faith walk, in your Christian walk, it's that in this world you're going to have trouble, and that's not the encouraging part. But it's the promise that you can take heart because Jesus has overcome the world. And if you could just rest on this certain hope that isn't a probability but a promise that because you are in right fellowship with Jesus, that you get this certain hope as a part of the deal. It comes with the package. That not only do you get salvation and grace and mercy, but you get certain hope that you can anchor your soul to. Listen, and if you hold on to that, then no matter what happens in this life, no matter what happens to you or your family or to your health or your mind, it is just a certain hope that says, you know, you know what a certain hope says? Certain hope isn't wishful hope or expectant hope. Uh, they might say, wishful hope might say to you, well, you know, my, my situation isn't that bad. Because, okay, certain hope says, you know what? My situation is actually very bad, but I still believe. Amen. Certain hope says, you know what? I am going through a financial problem right now, but I do believe that he is Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Certain hope doesn't, doesn't try to turn the blind eye to the realities of what you're going through. You see every single detail of the pain and the suffering and the grief, and yet you still choose to believe that God is greater than all of it. So you might say in your, in your reality today, you know what, my, my body is ravaged with sickness and pain. And the doctors have given me a report, but I still believe that he is Jehovah Rapha, my healer. You know what? My family might be a hot mess right now and full of dysfunction, but I still believe that if God put us together, man cannot separate us, and he is Jehovah Shalom. He is our Prince of Peace. Certain hope says you can hold on to it. You can anchor your soul to it. And whenever the devil shows up, and tries to steal, kill, and destroy, you can have great confidence that Jesus has defeated the devil. Can I get a hundred people to help me preach? Come on. Watch. And all of God's promises, all 3,000 plus promises in your Bible, have your name attached to them if you have a relationship with Jesus. They're yours to take hold of. And you can take, listen to me, you can take God's promises to the bank. They are a guarantee. There is an assurance with the promises that God offers. I love the way that Paul encouraged his friend Titus in his teaching and preaching and writing. And, and really, genuinely, this is, this is my heart. Every time that you gather here at Go Church, or whatever campus you're a part of, this Man, my aim, this is Paul talking, but it's the heart of your pastor too. My aim is just to raise hopes. You came in feeling discouraged and defeated and down and out. Like you can't take another step forward. You have fear and anxiety and panic attacks and depression. The enemy is just, he's unleashed hell against you and your family and your body and your money and, 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 and. But you walked in today. You showed up today. And so our prayer is, is that the Lord will just raise some hopes. And the only true way that you can raise hopes is if you are appointed to Jesus. Because remember, he is the source and the supplier of hope. Watch, my aim is to raise hopes by pointing the way to life without end. Can, let me encourage you with this too. Watch, there is the hope of heaven that this world and its messiness and pain and suffering and and just frustration and disappointment. This world is not our home. 
If you are in Christ Jesus, you get the hope of heaven that one day, whenever we breathe our last breath here on this earth, the Bible says to be absent from this body means that we get to be present with the Lord. Now, I don't believe that our work on this earth is done yet because if that were to be true, then you and I wouldn't exist. But one day, we will stand before God. And if our name is written in that Lamb's book of life, watch, then we get to inherit the kingdom of God. That's how we have this certain hope. That while this world is messed up, man, and it is messed up. Which, by the way, some of y'all need to stop watching the news. Just, and when it, yeah, it's, it's never good. I think a lot of the reason you can't sleep at night is because you watch too much Fox and CNN. And social media. Let's just be done with all. 2023 social media free. Come on, somebody. That's, that should be the theme right there. But how we make it through this world is knowing that this world is actually not our home. And that the decades that we live here, and we don't know how many years God is going to give us, but they fail in comparison to eternity. So we have our hopes being increased, our hopes being raised or elevated because we get this, this opportunity to believe that there is the hope of heaven. Watch how the verse ends here. This is the life that God promised long ago, and watch, and he doesn't break his promises. That's hard for many of us to process and understand because we deal with people who seemingly all day, every day break their promises. And some of you are the product of broken promises, and you stood in an altar of a church one day and said a vow until death do us part, but that spouse was unfaithful and broke that promise. Some of you, and, and rightfully so, you, you wrestle with the dynamic of your family and your home because you grew up in a home without a particular parent because they broke a promise. Hey, and watch this. Politicians... Their whole agenda is to make promises that they never care about keeping. Now, I know we've got a campus in Maryland, and they may not fully be aware that the state of Georgia was just in a runoff election. Man, and these two candidates, they just went back and forth with all of these promises. And the election is over, and thank God the commercials are done. Come on, somebody. Like... I got texts more times from both parties, and I'm like, how many of you as soon as you, stop, 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 opt out, opt out, opt out, opt out, stop, 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 stop. And these politicians, they make promises, and they never fully intend to keep those promises. People all day, every day will tell you what you want to hear, and very few have the integrity and the conviction to actually follow through. There used to be a day where people were good just by their word. There were no contracts and lawyers. Listen, some of you grew up in a culture in an era where if somebody said something, you could take that to the bank because they were going to keep their word. Nowadays, you better sign here, 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 and here because you look like a liar. Come on, somebody. <laughs> but God never breaks a promise. Why? Because he can't. It goes against his character. It goes against his nature. And because God can't change, Likewise, his promises are unchangeable. I hope you're feeling this word the way that I feel it in my heart. Hope just changes everything. 3,000 promises in the Bible, and you can hold on to all of them. I'm going to give you one just real quick. Because some of you, you are right in the middle of this storm. And you're trying to anchor down and hold on. But you feel like you've been treading water, but now you have no more stamina. And the pains of life and the difficulties of life are about to drown you. Here's a promise. And he doesn't break his promise, does he? Two verses here in Isaiah 43. Watch this. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Thank you for your word. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, can I get somebody just to be honest? Anybody going through the fire today? Come on. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. And here's why. Verse 3. For I am the Lord your God. I am the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Do you see that? 
And I know that you feel consumed. I know that you feel overwhelmed. I know that you feel defeated and deflated and discouraged. But watch this. No matter what you go through, God promises to be with us every single step of the way because he is our Lord. He's our only, only certain hope. I love what you see in Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, verse number 1, Jesus teaches his disciples a particular parable. And the reason that Jesus teaches this particular parable was to show the disciples, watch this, and I'll give you the verse, that they should always pray and they should never lose hope. Key words there, always, never, pray, hope. Always pray, never lose hope. Watch this, Luke 18, 1. And Jesus told his disciples this parable to show them that they should always pray and they should never lose hope. In our lifetime, one of the most, uh, and I hate, hate to use this word, but only for clarification and context, one of the greatest pastors, famous pastors here in the United States would have to be Pastor Rick Warren. For decades, pastored Saddleback Church out west, wrote the best-selling nonfiction book of all time, The Purpose Driven Life. How many of you know who I'm talking about? Recently retired from ministry and uh, just seems to be a pastor that maintained integrity and character and morals and values throughout his entire ministry, which should be applauded. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, this guy just, he stayed faithful. And I don't know all the details of what happened in their family, but I do know that unexpectedly, a few years ago, they lost their son. And if I'm not mistaken, it was by way of suicide. And out of that whole experience, out of that whole, you know, season of just grief and suffering and hurt, uh, Pastor Rick Warren wrote a book. And the title of the book was something to the effect of like the, the way to hope or the way to have hope. And in this book, he talked about this. And I'm going to give you the whole book on 10 slides, by the way, all right? But in the book, he talked about the 10 most common reasons for hopelessness and then the 10 reasons that you can hang on to certain hope. Does that make sense? He identified the top 10 reasons that people wrestle with hopelessness. And then he combats that with using the Lord's Prayer why you can have hope. And I just want you to see this today, and then I'll pray for you. One, one reason for hopelessness is this, because there are times that I feel abandoned, and there are times that I feel incredibly alone. But here's the hope. My heavenly Father, He will never abandon me. Our Father, who art in heaven. Another hopelessness is whenever our life seems to be out of control and we, we can't figure out life we, and we like to do that don't we just life seems to be chaotic but the hope is this is that God's power is greater than any problem that you could ever face hallowed be thy name another area of hopelessness is, is when I don't see a purpose I don't understand what's going on how can you get good out of the tragedy? How can you be sovereign in the suffering? But the hope is this. It's that God fits everything into his perfect plan. That even in our pain, God's got a purpose. Even in our suffering, God is still sovereign. Even in our tragedy, God can still get triumph. Thy kingdom come. Another reason for hopelessness is that people often grieve loss. And again, man... The grieving, the loss of a loved one is magnified in the holiday season. But the hope is this. God's got a greater purpose. God's got a great purpose for my life and for the reason I walk through whatever it is that I walk through. Watch, thy will be done. Can you pray that real quick? Come on, just your will be done in my life, Jesus. Not my will, but your will. Another area of hopelessness. When I don't have what I want, but here's the hope. God doesn't promise to give you everything you want, but he does promise to meet all of our needs. Come on. 
For I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Give us this day our daily bread. Is this encouraging anybody today? Come on. Another reason for hopelessness. Watch. When we've done something wrong, we've sinned against God. And now we're carrying the weight and the burden of of guilt and shame and regret. But here's the hope. When Jesus came, Jesus came to this earth and he died on an old rugged cross. And when Jesus died on that cross, he took our place for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Jesus took our place on that cross and he died. And when he died, he paid the bill. He paid the bill, and all of the wrong that we've done can be covered in the precious blood of Jesus, right? That's the hope. Forgive our trespasses. Another area for hopelessness is this. When somebody's hurt me, they've done me wrong, and I am deeply, deeply wounded and impacted, and now all of a sudden, bitterness and resentment It's welling up in my heart. But here's here's the hope. Watch. God will settle the score someday. Your Bible says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. You don't have to go chasing after the individual, you know, thinking and hoping that, well, i got to teach them a lesson. You worry about you. Don't let them steal your joy. Are you hearing that today? God will take care of them. You let God take care of you as we forgive those who trespass against us another area of hopelessness watch this when I'm being tempted when I'm being pulled in the wrong direction when I'm drifting when I'm straying from God when when I've when I've intentionally pulled up that anchor and now the current of culture and the temptations of this world are pulling me on here's the promise God has promised us the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit living in us and and working through us. And it is by the Holy Spirit, a, a, a supernatural power far greater than your own power that can help you overcome the temptations of this world. You can't overcome them on your own power, but by the Holy Spirit's power. Do you believe that? Lead us not into temptation. A couple of more. Watch this. Hopelessness. When I'm hounded by fear, I'm paralyzed by anxiety, I'm overcome with depression. Here's the hope. Watch. Jesus living in me is greater than any other power. And I know it's not just as simple as this statement. There is a process for some of us that we have to go through to overcome our anxiety and depression and fear. We are pro-counseling here at Go Church. But I do want to remind you that Jesus is just as close as the very mention of his name. That in the most fear-filled moments, in the most anxiety-filled moments, in the darkest moments, if you can just lift your hands, lift your voice, cry out the name Jesus, come on. Jesus promises to deliver us from evil. And one more, the hopelessness feeling is this. It looks like I'm done. I'm defeated. And the enemy is one, and I'm going to throw in the towel. Here is the hope. Listen to me. Watch. Woo. This ain't the end of your story, honey. This ain't the end. The devil should have killed you while he had his chance. But you are alive on purpose and for purpose. This isn't the end of the story. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Come on. I want you to say this with me on three. One, two, three. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. This isn't the end of the story. It's just a chapter in the book of your life. And if you'll let God keep writing your story from every page and every chapter, from the start to the finish, God will get the glory. God will get the honor for great things He has done. I'm not preaching about a wishful hope. I'm not talking about an expectant hope. There is a certain hope that you can anchor your soul to and when the darkness of this world consumes you you will not quit. You will not turn your back on God. God will remain faithful because God is good all the time. 
and in all the time, God is good. Every campus, every person, lift your hands. Come on, all around every auditorium. Fill me with hope. Fill me with joy. Fill me with peace. Come on, pray this prayer. And I don't just want you to fill me. I want it to overflow. I want it to spill over on my family. Spill over on my friends. I want to see them this holiday season and them say, how can you be full of so much hope only by the God of hope? That no matter what I walk through, no matter what I go through, there is a certain hope and the winds won't take me out. The waves won't take me out. The storms won't take me out. Hope has a name. His name is Jesus and his hope changes everything. Come on and give God the best praise. Come on, somebody clap till you get your breakthrough. Come on, somebody clap till you get the hope that you need. Come on. Somebody clap hope for your family. Hope for your children. Hope for your grandchildren. Hope for your mind. Hope for your body. Hope for your wallet. Come on. Hope for your marriage. Hope has a name. And his name is Jesus. And your hope, your hope changes everything. Let me pray for you. What the Holy Spirit speak to your heart today? And what's your next step? Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm getting off this stage fast. If you're here today, the only way you get this hope is if you say yes to Jesus and you come into right relationship. The reason many of you feel so hopeless is because you're trying to figure out the suffering of this world on your own ability and your own wisdom and your own knowledge and your own intellect and hopelessness will abound but if you'll just hit your knees and you'll lift your hands and you'll surrender your heart and your life to God hope will show up and in a moment his salvation and his grace and his mercy will sweep over you. It doesn't mean you'll get out of the problem. It doesn't mean the pain will be fully eliminated, but it does mean you never have to walk through one more dark day by yourself. Hope has a name. Every head bowed, every eye closed, every campus. If you want to make Jesus your Lord and Savior, repent of your sin, come back to God. You've been drifting, you've been straying. You're ready to come home to God. If that's you, I'm counting to three. Hands go up at every campus. Campus pastors are looking, and we're only counting to give God the glory, all right? One, two, three. Hands up. Keep them high for a moment. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, west side. Germantown, I want you to count. I'm counting in here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. Lord, every hand that was lifted. 25, we cry out to you today, God. We're asking you to forgive us of our sin. Wash us clean. Come into our hearts and our minds. Give us grace and mercy and salvation. That's what produces the hope of heaven. Fill us up with hope. Fill us up with joy and peace. And now may we anchor our souls to a foundation that is firm and secure. A certain hope that is assured and guaranteed. And may I step into the beautiful promises of God for my life. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And the church said amen and amen. Let's give Jesus Christ the best ovation we got. Come on.